Hello and welcome to 25 North After Dark, or maybe we're calling it Mutiny. I'm your food guru, Johnny, and with me we have... The Cthulian Witch, Prakta. And, and Rachel. <laughs> I don't, I don't get a special thing. <laughs> I had to make sure you didn't know that the titles were coming, so uh, you'd have a, you'd keep it on, keep you on your toes. So um, today we're talking a little bit about the mechanical side of the game, where where our normal actual play is much more about the narrative and about the day to day play of the game. So, Rachel, you asked the question that provided the impetus for this discussion. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the genesis of that question and expound on what exactly we're trying to discuss here? Yeah, yeah. So I've been really enjoying Rodin's, uh, what I think of as utility play, and Procta too. Um, just their bonuses, their buffs and debuffs, you know, frightened, grabbed, all of those conditions. Whereas... I usually just go straight damage. So I was really curious to pick uh, Johnny's brain and Cynthia's brain about why and how they make those choices about damage versus utility play. It's such a cool question. And I think that Pathfinder is a game that really encourages that question a lot because uh, Pathfinder is a game that makes it so that those plus ones and those minus ones and, and kind of this non-straightforward gameplay uh, is just as important as the straightforward part. So I've got this kind of extended metaphor uh, that I've come up with um, for us to, to kind of use to visualize the way that we can think of a combat. So uh, here's the metaphor. Fighting is a foot race. And so uh, we can think of, uh, um, we've got two teams and they're both trying to run the distance uh, of the other team's hit points, right? The opposing team's hit points is the length that you have to run. Dealing damage is just like taking a step. And the more damage you do, the bigger the step. So because bosses have fewer steps that they can take compared to a whole team, they do absolutely massive damage to take mm -hmm. very large steps. So, uh, so dealing damage is the way to win, right? You can't win a race without running or taking steps. So every team has to have the capacity to deal damage. Without Sil, uh, if it's a team full of rodents just doing trips all day or a team full of proctors just doing frightens, we're not getting anywhere. So sure. we, we have to have some capacity to deal damage. But that said, most combats are set up so that doing damage alone won't deal, won't do the trick at all because your enemies have your high armor classes and defenses. And so you would be making a lot of very tiny steps, you know, without, you know, trying to get your flanks or your flat footed and, and that sort of thing. Uh, what you're really looking for here is a lot of long strides. You don't want to be a dachshund. You want to be a gazelle. You want these big, long strides. And by that, by these long strides, I mean critical hits. Critical hits are surprisingly easy to do because all you need to do is hit plus 10 above a target. And we've got a lot of ways to move that plus 10, make it very, very easy for us to hit that plus 10. So let's talk about the second part. We've discussed damage. Now let's talk about our buffs and debuffs. That's your plus ones to your team and your minus ones on the other side. You're aiding. Uh, you can think of inspire courage or bless. Or on the other side, you can think of demoralize or fear or, or proctus uh, hex evil eye. Um, these these uh, I think of as changing the length of your stride. So when you perform buffs or debuffs, they're crucial in making sure that you get those big crits. And crits are way bigger than just two hits in PF2E. Uh, I, it, uh, there are things like critical specialization and other effects like fatal or deadly that we have seen on Wands weapons uh, that make it so that they do additional damage on a crit beyond even the regular weapon damage. And it's also true for weapon runes as we get later on in, in, this, in, the, in, in the fight or rather in the campaign, uh, we get access to a, no a bunch of other options that also make it so that crits are, again, just so much better than two hits. If you guys take nothing else, you guys being the audience here, if you guys take nothing else from what I say today, just remember that critical hits 
are way better than two regular hits. And that will like guide the way that you are playing this game and you will be playing the game at a much, much higher level. The math here is set up in a super interesting way so that um, helping out your teammates is rewarded a lot more than picking up a, a, a strike for yourself. So uh, in terms of how we think about how powerful debuffs and buffs are, I've got a new metaphor. There's a second metaphor. It's about to hit the building. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, but when we think about how powerful these buffs and debuffs are, we can think about it in terms of encounter threat level. And encounter threat level is sort of the way that um, uh, Pathfinder lets GMs figure out how hard a fight is. So let's think about a trivial encounter. Um, you can have trivial threat encounters or low or moderate or hard or severe or extreme, right? So on, on the one end, a trivial encounter is one where the PCs have no chance of losing. They should not even have to expend spell slots or once a day features. It's meant to be a reminder of how awesome characters are. Think about superheroes fighting not even C-tier supervillains, but like bank robbers, right? This is the one where you're like, ha ha, check out how cool this guy is. And you know, you're, you're flexing, you're showing mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. All right. On the other side, an extreme encounter is unfairly hard. It is one where your team has literally an even chance of having a total party kill. It is a fairly probable death sentence for one of the PCs. They advise an extreme encounter as a once in a campaign thing, like the climactic thing at the very end of a campaign when a beloved hero is destined to fall. Uh, and I've also seen extreme encounters used as guards for extremely powerful bonus treasure. Uh, and I, I'm wondering here if, if I'm making the right comparison. So Cynthia, I need you to check me here. But I think, I, I think extreme encounters uh, are a little bit like the emerald weapon in Final Fantasy. Oh am yeah. I talk, am mm -hmm. I talking? Am I saying anything that makes sense there? I, I'm not too familiar with it because I, I, I've not played any Final Fantasy games. I've only played Chrono Trigger. Thank God, I, I haven't <laughs> missed out on Chrono Trigger. <laughs> yeah, no, that is correct. It's essentially the very um, end of boss, uh, the end game. Um, hurdle that you need to overcome and i think that that is a great analogy okay uh do yep. you get do you get any special goodies after you beat emerald weapon or, or ruby weapon i think is also another uh yeah you get like some nice drops i don't remember off the top of my head but you certainly do like, okay from gear to weapons to etc yep okay cool so an extreme encounter is um uh kind of this is the hardest thing that the game can feasibly throw at you without saying uh, you know, you guys are doomed to fail, and like this is a, this is like one of those in uh, Secret of Mana. I think starts with a fight that you're doomed to fail. Um, Correct. You know, there we go. So mm -hmm. now we're really tapping all the way into the, these video game analogies. Yeah, I guess. the first little buggy, and you have to get bailed out repeatedly. Yeah. Right. So extreme is as hard as it can get, and then trivial is about as easy as it can get. So uh, when we're thinking about these uh, threats here, the strength of a creature is defined by levels, just like it is for PCs. So if you're fighting one creature that is party level plus four, that is if you're level three and you're fighting a level seven creature, that's an extreme encounter. Level three versus level seven. Or, yeah, level three versus level seven is an extreme encounter. Your level plus three is severe. Your level plus two is moderate. And if you're fighting only one creature and that creature is just the party's level, that's a trivial encounter. So if you're fighting, if you're level three and if your team's level three and you're fighting a, a level three creature, that's a trivial. So difference is, uh, you know, one creature, your, your party's level plus four, extreme, terrifying, horrific. But you can, if, the, if it's just one creature and it's your level, that's a trivial encounter. So the numerical difference in these levels was made to be very easy for GMs to tweak because they want to make it so that if if you need to fight a giant centipede and a giant centipede is a level two or a, yeah, a level a level two creature, but you've got level one uh, level one PCs, we can make it so that you guys can just you know 
drop it by one uh, so that everybody gets to fight the thematically appropriate thing very easily. Or, you know, alternately, if you add a PC, uh, we can tweak up the difficulty. All you do to change the level of a creature is you add plus one to every number on its stat block. Very easy. Um, mm -hmm. So in this particular situation, we're looking at the level of the fights for what purpose? For so, talking uh, about the debuffs and buffs and the action economy? Exactly. So we're about to have, uh, we're about to be able to understand how powerful these debuffs and these buffs are. Uh, because we're going to be able to look at a fight in terms of, can we take a fight from extreme to trivial? I think we mm -hmm. can. So let, let's let's come up with a way oh, of doing okay. that. So if we were to debuff all of these threats that we're looking at, uh, we're kind of dropping their level, right? You get a minus yes. one to everything, and that's kind of one level sure. less. Yeah. So we start with level plus four. It's this unfair fight. They're going to mop the floor with us, but then... We get to go to work. Uh, we get it flat-footed by, by flanking it or grabbing it, and then we get it frightened to, or maybe sickened to. Frightened to drops every stat by two, right? Maybe we okay. get it prone because mm -hmm. uh, pr uh, prone gives it a minus two circumstance penalty to attacks. So, all right, we've got it flat-footed that lowers its defenses by two. We've got it frightened that lowers everything by two. We've got it prone that lowers its offenses by two. Well, uh, at this point, we've kind of, we've given it uh, a delta of plus or minus two in terms of both offense. You know, that lowered AC is, that AC is lowered by four. And in terms of our defense, it's got a minus four penalty to its mm -hmm, attacks mm -hmm. in our scenario. So we just made an extreme threat level encounter into a trivial encounter by applying three conditions. That's, that's all. That's true, yeah, that, sure. That's all. Sure, so, sure. Um, uh, these penalties are, are now, you know, when, when they, when they're talking about these extreme threat encounters, they say they're quote, too challenging for most uses. You're not supposed to have more than one of these in, in a campaign. And then they go on to say, except quote, for a group of veteran players using advanced tactics and teamwork. So if mm -hmm. you're, if you're, if you're us, because we're, we're obviously an advanced team. Clearly. Advanced yes. <laughs> tactics and teamwork. If you're us, not only is that us, that's us taking an extreme encounter and making it mild as milk before we start adding in the bonuses that we can give to ourselves. We're just talking mm -hmm. about debuffs on that side, right? Yes. Uh, then we start adding in your, your plus two aid or your inspire courage or your inspire defense. Mm -hmm. And and we are just really, really, really moving the needle and making those critical hits very easy to do. And the critical hits, that's you taking two and a half steps, three steps with one action. Mm -hmm. Love to see those. Speaking of actions, let's move on to the third part here, actions. Battles in Pathfinder 2E are really short. Uh, nearly every battle is only three or four rounds. And that means that there, if you have a boss here, we're looking at that extreme threat encounter, uh, That's a, that boss only has nine actions, maybe 12 actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and similarly, you got to remember that your number of actions are very small too. So every single action that you take counts. Every step that you can take counts and every step that you can remove uh, from your enemy really counts, okay? So uh, so if you slow an enemy, that's removing one of nine possible steps in a race. You've like their total output in the combat, if you get, if you remove one action is down by one ninth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? So that, that reduces your chances of catching a TPK massively uh, by, by removing those. Um, and if you get them slowed for more than one round, that's reducing their total possible steps in the race by a third. Yeah. If you, if you have them removed uh, every turn, they've got one action removed, they are, wow, wow, we're doing a lot there. Sure, uh, same for prone then too, right? Trip them, mm -hmm. they have to stand up. 
Bingo, bingo. Exactly. That's exactly the stuff. So uh, uh, there are also statuses like Practa uh, can can do slow. Uh, Practa can also, um, I think, eventually. I don't know exactly uh, which is work, but I think uh, you get access to something that inflicts confused. Exactly. Yeah. And man, oh man, when we think about actions and debuffing confused, confused takes a step away from the enemy, then it applies it to you because mm -hmm. an enemy can end up attacking another enemy. Another instead. enemy. Yeah. Can can you remind me what confused does? What Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. It's it's one of the the uh it's one of the conf the conditions that you can inflict uh, that um, makes it so that an enemy uh, at, at any given time has only a random chance of hitting uh, anybody. So every, it has to spend every one of its actions hitting the thing closest to it. Oh, nice. Yeah. So in, in super ideal scenarios, you can make it so that absolutely that enemy is hitting another enemy. Yeah. Uh, and even if you're even if you're in just a, a regular scenario, um, the the enemy that your enemy hits is is dictated at random. So it could be you, uh, it could be an enemy of theirs, it could mm -hmm. be uh, an enemy of yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's also, an incredible. One. Mm -hmm. Another great thing about confusion or the the confused status is that you are flat footed. So. And you can oh, also you can't delay attack. or ready any actions, and you have to spend all of your actions uh, essentially in offensive uh, maneuvers. So you can move to a target, attack. But the the cool thing is that you are flat footed. So that is such a good point. That wow. is such a yeah. great status. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, flat footed is again a minus two penalty to your AC. So once again, it's just really good because. If you have multiple characters that can inflict uh, like a flat footer without having to, you know, surround the, the mm -hmm. enemy and then getting, you know, putting yourself open for an attack, then yeah, as that's a much better. Flat yeah. footed, you know, what I'm looking yeah. for all day. And that's an extra D6 of sneak damage. So, mm -hmm. which is more than my regular D4 of standard damage. So. Yeah. Right, and that that flat footed is a really useful one uh, for uh, our team because we've got ranged characters like Juan and Practa and Rizzer, unless Rizzer wants to mm -hmm. attack with his claws. So uh, very rarely can, can Juan or Practa or Rizzer get flat footed mm -hmm. because they can't move into flank. Like flank right. is the the easy way b by which we get that flat footed. So mm -hmm. uh, great, great great point about confused applying flat foot by itself that's who boy that's an excellent one and the best thing to do actually is to mess with both actions and debuffing now we're really getting into something juicy because we're robbing them of of a, a massive chunk of what they can do and we're making their remaining actions less useful too so um sort of uh, the way that I've been thinking about Roden um, is that he's built around doing a trip to debuff uh, one of their attacks or to force them into spending an action to stand up. So tripping is that, that minus two circumstance penalty if, if they're prone. So uh, kind of my next thing that I'm looking for is to take combat grab, which is the core of the build. If you take trip and you, you strike an enemy prone, then you succeed in a combat grab. Then if your opponent wants to stand up and be mobile and do stuff, they have to escape a grab and then stand up. Now, escaping is, is an attack action. That, that inflicts a multiple attack penalty on you. Mm -hmm. So, wowie zowie, we're talking about your first thing that you have to do uh, in order to do what you want most in the world is you have to uh, do an escape of a grapple, and admittedly, most bosses are easily gonna be able to make that escape, but that's one action gone. Uh, and now you're at multiple attack penalty. So let's imagine you're the enemy right now, uh, at one action deep on the enemy's turn. Uh, you, you would now have minus seven to your first attack on the turn. 
that means that you absolutely have to spend your next action standing up so that you can be at only minus five right. to take to take your mm -hmm. last action of the turn, which is your first offensive action of the turn, is you 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 can make finally an attack at minus five. That's the best thing you can do uh, with this combat grab idea that I've had. What level do you get that at? Uh, I'll be able to get combat grab at level four, but I cannot lie. I've I had, I constructed Roden uh, thinking that I would want to take the wrestler archetype. And then mm -hmm. the Bastion archetype, so that Bastion gives me reactive shield, raises that AC so that when I'm the only frontliner tangling with him, uh, my AC is still sky high. So I actually kind of regret not just getting a fighter and having combat yeah. grab and reactive shield in my first two levels. Could have really had this a little bit online, just a little bit faster. But, sure. but we like monks. I think they're really fun. Um, so, uh, at level four, I'm going to have that combat grab and we're going to be able to do all these nice things here. Uh, and, and again, that flat footed is huge for these, mm -hmm. this ranged party, you know, uh, Syl can even, uh, uh, attack at ranged and consistently get that sneak attack damage from having that constant flat footed. Right. Which is hard to play a different rogue who's an archer or, you know, bow and arrow. And it's so hard to get combat or uh, flat footed with them. So that's, that's cool. Exactly. And, and we've been yeah. able to observe, uh, we've been able to actually watch uh, Juan use pistol twirl, which mm -hmm. um, that requires an action on Juan's turn. Uh, that has a chance of failing to grant Juan flat footed. Uh, so my thought is why don't I, why don't I just, take this one over for Juan so that right. Juan mm -hmm. can spend Juan's actions setting up to get that critical with that big fatal die mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so that now th the base damage is up bigger and there are extra dice in addition to the critical damage. Wow. So That's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that is the reason why I wanted to build something like Roden um, to have this primary attack target so he has the high AC with his mountain stance and shield. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've built it so that everybody else can just kind of stand back uh, as much as possible um, and especially for Juan in particular uh, with with all those fatal and the and the, uh, the deadly as well on that rapier. Yeah, that's it's nice for one person to use an action to give the entire party a benefit for sure. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, and, and that's that's kind of that's kind of uh, uh, the big sort of uh, I don't know utility for me comes down to a mixture of, of robbing actions or of doing what I think of as your your pure buffing and debuffing, adding mm -hmm. these pluses and minuses. Yeah, in the past I'd always only really I played a. A uh, barbarian who I was like, oh, maybe I'll grab, but the the map just added up, and so I ended up going frightened. I really like frightened as a debuff, as a actual intimidation, because it doesn't induce map, um, and you still get that that debuff in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that is so neat to hear from from you, Johnny, and how you built Roden uh, based around this, because we have all benefited from it uh, during gameplay when uh, Roden has stripped an enemy and then it just lowers, you know, it's prone. So now you can wail on it and mm -hmm. try to do as much damage and do the the very um, eloquently put uh, analogy that you did. You, you can have more time to go and, and get ahead of that hit point race. So that is excellent. And to be honest, one of the things that um, I had in mind when building or while building Prakta was essentially a similar thing, but taking it into a, a twist because Prakta is a spellcaster, right? Like she can't really go in there and, and raise a shield or trip. She's more into the, the mental kind of damage where the hexes are the main um, driver of practice gameplay so every time that we have an encounter um i try to do the evil eye 
And so that essentially frightens uh, the target and that helps reduce AC and also saving throws. So I think that that's really important whenever I'm able to, to do it, then I, I do it. Unfortunately, we've been encountering a lot of enemies that don't that are like mindless. So mm-hmm. it's not uh, doable in all of them in all of these encounters. Uh, but other than that, the spells that I picked up, I mean, Fear, charm, days. I mean, when days, days does mental damage too, right? Uh, but if the target critically critically fails, uh, their saving throw, they could also be stunned, and it's happened once before. So you're trying to fish for that critical fail, and then hopefully get a target stunned, and then we get back into this um, topic that Johnny uh, brought over, which is the action economy. If you rob them of that one action, then they can uh, run as fast as your potty can and get more of those sweet, sweet uh, hit points. So eventually, yeah, Prakta is, is once again headed into that mental mental damage, frightened, uh, charm, days, um, and uh, at some point, uh, confusion status, which is also so, so good and so, so sweet whenever it works. Yeah, it seems like um, the game is really set up by introducing the concept of the multiple attack penalty and by making it such a cripplingly large penalty mm-hmm. really makes it so that um, every turn you're probably going to be doing something direct, directly damage doing Um and every turn you're also gonna be doing some amount of setup for either yourself or your party. Right, uh, But yeah. I, th- I think that um, there are some, like gunslingers, uh, for example, and rogues sometimes, uh, are not set up to do any setup at all. You guys mm-hmm. are just the closers, you're the finishers. Mm-hmm. Right, and, yes. And, and the best thing that you guys need, or a fighter, or a barbarian, or a swashbuckler, what you guys need is for somebody else to do all the setup for you. And then once we set them up, you knock them down. You know, mm-hmm. you get you get two crits, Sill, and it mm-hmm. is just over for anybody. You know, yeah. you get that sneak damage <laughs> yes. twice, like, okay, uh, next next enemy, you know. Right. And Absolutely. The... the uh... You can use the agile weapons too, right? To reduce the map. So it's not so bad to take that third swing if it's only a minus eight versus minus 10. Mm-hmm. That's right. But that agile comes at a price too because agile uh, tends to lower the weapon damage dice on the right. top end. Yeah. So you need to really be building into making multiple attacks a turn. You need to be thinking about like being a fighter or a ranger. Uh, Flurry Ranger has the ability to minimize multiple attack penalty. But Mm -hmm. if you're going to be making multiple attacks a turn, um, you need to either be a closer, right? Like you, uh, or um, you you need to really just kind of know what you're doing, I guess. Because um, certainly everybody knows that the third action should, should never be a third attack. At that right. minus ten, mm-hmm. you know, you're you're definitely not going to get a crit. You may may barely hit, you know, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, uh, the game is kind of set up so that people do one big hit, and especially for uh, somebody like Juan, we need to look for every advantage where uh, Juan has a higher proficiency with a gun, uh, and then if we can get a flat-footed and a frighten on top of that, then. Um, Uh, We make it so that when she rolls an 18, a 19, or a 20, she crits, right? Yeah. We can triple her chance of critting from just a 20 up to an 18, 19, 20, just by lowering uh, the enemy's AC enough. And -hmm. that is when we've got triple the crits like that, the game is now on easy mode. (laughs) Yes. Yes. You know, sure. one one of the things that I also like about Rodan, besides, you know, setting up the, the battlefield and everything else, is you also can do so much damage, like with the flurry of blows. I mean, I've been blown away by, there's been t- like a few times where you've critted with your flurry of blows, and that totally demolishes the, the enemies. So having that versatility is just fantastic. It is, uh, this is an unusual build to have a strength monk and strength is very, very, very powerful in the early game because it, it, could, it can basically emulate adding an entire extra D6 of damage, right? Mm-hmm. But um, that is just a sweet 
sort of nice thing that we're that we have happening during these very early level levels because very soon rodents damage is going to fall off compared to uh, especially wands especially practice um, he's not going to be doing anything close to as much damage as they can once we start doing extra weapon dice of damage mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the strength starts to get a little bit lost in the wash there but it is incredibly incredibly nice to have a high strength character very very early on but i think uh probably by level um right around now is when it starts coming out in the wash by level five uh you're gonna see my strength matter much much less uh, mm-hmm. and i'm i'm gonna quit being the primary damage dealer certainly by level level seven uh, I think everybody is going to be pretty much outstripping me, but it may be as early as level five. I will no longer be um, uh, even in the same like weight class as Sil in mm-hmm. terms of damage doing. So what is happening with that exchange? I mean, the DPS is not going to be at the same level, but what is going to be uh, augmenting and rodents bill compared to others? So as others are going to develop a lot more damage, uh, doing potential, um, you guys are going to uh, you guys are, are going to get various boosts to your your damage doing, uh, like your weapon specialization or your weapon mastery rather, um, and that sort of thing. Um, and then as that continues on, Roden, I'm, I'm I'm setting him up so that he'll be able to specialize in action thievery. Uh, the most like Mm -hmm. that trip and that combat grab is really what i'm kind of setting everything up for and from there um once you've got that trip and that combat grab you're if you're able to waste two actions out of a boss's turn i feel like that's enough action thievery and now we need to make sure that i live long enough to do that (laughs) Uh, and and that's that's what i'm going to be able to that's what i'm going to switch around to uh the bastion archetype and mm-hmm. I'm going to make my shield a lot stronger and make it so that my AC is always way, way, way high when I'm the one sort of lone wolf tangling with the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's sort of the dream. And it's it's hard to build a tank in Pathfinder 2E, but I think that um, this is one way by which you can make that, that idea work. Excellent. Yeah, it's going to be awesome to see. Oh, I'm right looking on. forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and that is my that's my ten thousand foot view of the the tactics in Pathfinder <laughs> and kind of my idea for why I built Roden this way. And uh, I'm, do you guys yeah. have anything else you wanna you wanna add or any other reflections on damage versus utility? I'm still digesting everything you said. Thanks for letting us pick your brain, though. It was yeah, pretty cool. Thank you for attending my TED talk. I really, <laughs> uh, I didn't, no, I didn't, yeah. It was excellent. Uh, I mean, I love the analogy. And I think that not many people think about, you know, strategy ahead of time in many, you know, um, uh, like D&D or Pathfinder groups, at least not with pugs or just like groups that are randomly made. It's just Mm -hmm. either I'm a straight up healer or straight up tank or straight up DPS. Um, But just having this hybrid support DPS characters just can truly change the way your adventure goes and just the flavor overall. So I've, I've always appreciated support characters uh, in quotations um, because it is so much easier to fight an enemy when it's uh, prone, when it's flat-footed, when it's confused or stunned, etc. So I, I absolutely loved uh, hearing you uh, today in your TED Talk, Johnny. <laughs> right on, and I just I just love the way that uh, they make it so that a bard is as strong as a fighter, like, mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. and truly. Like that is so strong to be able to add those plus ones, and you feel it makes it so that everybody contributes to the setup, and then everybody kind of has a hand on the ball. So when the closer mm-hmm. does that damage, like Sil, uh, yes, you did forty damage, but right. I I made you do that for you, yeah, you know? You get yeah. to feel good when Syl comes in and steals the kill. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the power <laughs> of Pathfinder. And that's the, that's, that's the thing that makes every role very satisfying to play in this game. Awesome. That is true. Right on. Well, I hope that everybody enjoyed uh, 25 North after dark, or maybe we're calling it mutiny. I'm not sure which, uh, but I hope that your party will never end. May your parties never end.